Welcome to the first Academy of Indian Marketing and NITI workshop on consumer insights. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person myself. This is a great workshop. We have got excellent academic scholars and industry experts who are totally focused on consumer insights. My presentation is primarily to give you overarching reality about consumer insights research in countries like India and kinds of things we should watch out for as we progress our journey toward learning more about consumers and deep dive into the realm of both psychology as well as their behavior. Let me start by a couple of observations. First observation is that ultimately it is the end user and the consumer that generates demand for all products and services directly or indirectly. Whether it is food, shelter and clothing, or cars, computers and cell phones, or electricity, internet and social media. In other words, both in the services sector as well as in the product sector, end consumer matters. So understanding end consumers becomes more and more relevant or important of course, when you're doing business directly, you have the databases, as it is true in the banking sector, as it is true in most of the services where you have a direct billing, invoicing to the customer, and you may have a direct behavior that you can manage or you can observe, analyze it. But it becomes even strategically more important in those companies that sell through distributors, dealers, or resellers. So if you are selling through the internet, for example, e-commerce platforms, or if you are selling through organized retailing, or if you are selling through this massive uh, sort of a mom and pop distribution system in India, it is even more important. Because it is not just your immediate customer who is the trader, the stockist, the distributor, but it is the end user customer that matters. And learning that can give you more pull power into influencing or managing your immediate customer, not just the brand aspect, but also how the end consumer is changing. Second point, the farther removed you are from the end consumer, such as industrial raw materials or basic chemicals, or in supply chain, deep into the supply chain, the more important it is to understand the end users. I really learned this way back when, 40, 50 years ago, from DuPont. DuPont never sold anything to end consumers. But they had a great market research department, we used to call that market research at that time, understanding end consumers because they wanted to make sure they got the consumer preferences before they went to General Motors to sell the paint technology or anti-corrosives which is fascinating, an industrial company having more consumer insights than consumer company. And that's what I remember quite a lot. Why consumer insights is critical in emerging markets? There are five, six points. The big point I would like to make is that biggest competition is unbranded competition. Whereas our knowledge in the marketplace is all about brands competing with brands. So how do you understand unbranded competition, consumer preferences about unbranded street products, local vendor, etc., as opposed to a globally advertised, promoted brand? Markets are highly unorganized. In fact, in many countries, it is not unusual to have nine-step distribution system from the producer to the end consumer. Whereas in most advanced countries, it will be only two steps, maybe one step even, with e-commerce nowadays. Lack of affordability. One of the biggest issues for branded products in emerging markets is that they are just too expensive. Maybe they were designed or they were marketed primarily for the upper socioeconomic class and not for the masses, but masses is where the markets are. Also, these markets are governed by socio-political governance, primarily by faith or faith belief systems on the one hand, or by the mafia on the other hand. So they are the gatekeepers to access these markets. 
So how do you either co-opt with them or you bypass them? And of course, many of these markets are deep into rural populations, which has no infrastructure, no logistics, no warehousing, and how do you reach them? So access is as important as affordability. And the last and a very important point is that these markets are not homogeneous. We in the Western world may think that all emerging markets look alike. Within an emerging market like India, there is no diversity. It's absolutely opposite. The diversity both in terms of income, diversity in terms of education, diversity in terms of, for example, uh, gender differences, faith differences is massive. And most of the demand is highly skewed and therefore we need to understand market heterogeneity and especially what is known as the base of the pyramid or bottom of the pyramid population, the poor people in some fashion. Why it is more important in India? Let me take a couple of slides to talk about specifics of India. The first major point is that in India, generation gap is rapidly widening. Generation gap is less than eight years now. The older sister cannot relate to the younger sister, not only in fact in, um, let's say, lifestyle, outward appearances, but in basic family values. There's a huge discontinuity and most consumption is usually learned as an early childhood socialization, product preferences, brand preferences, when you consume, how you consume are all trained in the early days of life, but that is not the case. So it's new consumer that's coming in the marketplace is radically different than the previous generations and hence that knowledge is not as valuable. Rise of the roommate family. Today, a modern family with all of the technology possible has no time to eat together. All spouses are working. Interestingly, there is in fact a level playing field between a breadwinner and a homemaker. So everybody eats on their own now, or even if you eat one meal together, somebody goes out and does the text messaging, somebody does video watching, somebody is talking on the phone, etc., etc. So we are living more like a roommate family where individualistic lifestyles, working women households, and the use of smartphones and social media, we need to understand. Third, smartphones and 4G revolution in India. The 4G access the internet with a wide bandwidth now, having almost a large uh, uh, Wi-Fi system on a national level, essentially. So you have the examples of Reliance Geo on the one hand, which has totally revolutionized the infrastructure for e-commerce, for communication, for transactions. And of course, we now have rural reach. It's possible to have rural access on the level playing field as it will be almost an urban access because of the technology. More and more consumers in India are switching from unbranded to branded products and services. And this goes for rice, lentils, atta, vegetables, anything you think about. People are giving up on unbranded products for more and more branded products. We have a growing e-commerce and organized retailing. Flipkart has become a pretty big e-commerce platform which is very fascinating out of nowhere in a country which otherwise has a poor financial infrastructure, has poor physical infrastructure, but even then they are doing quite well. And surprisingly, companies like Flipkart and their competition, they're finding more markets in second tier cities or even in rural populations, which is fascinating. It's not strictly concentrated in the urban market. You have already seen the success of Big Bazaar at one time. Unorganized retailing to organized retailing, one-stop shop. It's very much like Walmart in this country, for example. Anything you want, you can get it, both branded and unbranded products, which is absolutely incredible success story at one time. Decline of multi-generational loyalty 
to the neighborhood stores. The older generation had several generations of loyalty because you lived in the same house forever. The nearby Kirana shop, Panwala even, would send a delivery boy every day to find out what you want, make a list and in the evening he will deliver that. The merchant even actually financed sometimes if the fa family had no money to pay, let's say, at the end of the month or beginning of the month. So the shopkeepers and street vendors' loyalties are going away by the new generation of uh, young people. They would rather shop in a more organized retailer like Big Bazaar or Metro or whatever they are. And this is a very key disconnect from the traditional way we marketed in emerging markets to the newer way. Let me look at the Consumer Insights research and its evolution over time. In the old days, primary research was what I call observer research. Professionals went out in the rural market, talked to the villagers, observed how they behaved, very much like the Odyssey research as we call it nowadays. Mostly it will be spoken language. Sometimes they make some notes, etc., and they write up a report about understanding consumers in the markets. That was very common. We gave that way next one to opinion research which was a formal surveys that were sent out. There were companies after companies like Nielsen type companies, for example, or ORG Mark, and they were involved in having panels, sending out questionnaires, very much like what you do with the Census Bureau kinds of approach. That is interesting. Today, what we have is what I call data research. There's so much of information out there, both on the web, essentially, through social media, that we have actual and panels where we have the actual behavior and today we are shifting therefore from observer research to data research. So over time that has evolved and in the process on the x-axis as you can see our scientific rigor has gone up. In other words many of the subjectivity involved in doing the observer research is going way to a little more scientific approach. The data are data. You cannot uh, fudge with the reality in many ways. So research is becoming less subjective and more evidence-based, which I think is fascinating. However, still there are five biases as we do research on consumer insights in emerging markets. The first one is very important one all of us are specialists. We are trained in one technique, whatever the technique is, whether it is multidimensional scaling, conjoint analysis, factor analysis, discriminant analysis, customer lifetime value. And we think that we look at the whole analysis only from that viewpoint. And the data may or may not be amenable to that particular technique. In marketing, we always have fads and fashions about techniques over time. By teaching more than 50 years, I've seen several cycles. I studied operations research, Marco chains, for example, stochastic processes, and those were the primary things, linear programming. Then we shifted to multivariate statistics, which I did a lot of research myself and taught quite a lot multivariate or technique analytics uh, workshops. Today it has shifted in fact to more and more econometric modeling for example using real world data and it is about to shift now more toward text messaging. So we have a technique bias whereas the data may not be amenable to the technique. So I would strongly recommend we watch for technique bias as we do research on consumer insights. Similarly there is a perspective bias. If I'm trained as a psychologist, I will look at the world one way. If I'm trained as an economist, I will look at the world differently. That's again very important. Our own backgrounds creates perspectives in us. Again, because of that perspective, I look at the world one way. 
It is very similar to the old fable, the elephant and the bly, five blind men. I, if I touch the tail of the elephant, I think it's a rope. If I touch the legs of the elephant, I think it's a trunk of a tree. If I touch the nose of the elephant, I think it's a serpent or a something like that, whatever turns out to be the fable that we have. But it's a great message. All of us have a limited or a biased perspective, and that bias comes through in our research in the way we look at the consumers. The third one is a normative bias. In other words, what the consumer should be doing versus what the consumer is actually doing. This is fascinating. About 40 years ago, I did research on consumer protection or consumerism. Ralph Nader was becoming a major voice advocating pro-consumer views. Magazines like Consumer Reports were becoming very important to study and understand. And then I suddenly realized that all of this is very educated perspective about the poor people. What is it that they want? What is it that what they do? There was a famous book I remember reading and teaching called The Poor Pay More by David Kaplowitz, a top sociologist, but he had a normative view. Consumers shouldn't be spending money like that. It's not good for them as opposed to actually what they do. Lots of studies were done in poor neighborhoods in the New York area. I find also elitism bias. And this is a little more prevalent in countries like India or in traditional societies. If I'm the educated person, I look upon the less educated people in a very different way. It somewhat matches with the normative bias, but it's independent of normative bias. It's fascinating. So can we be agnostic? Can we not make a judgment ahead of time about consumers, how they are living, why they are living the way they are living, or what they should do? And the last bias, of course, is what I call the Western bias, especially North American bias, because North America leads in consumer research, consumer insights. So we take all of our knowledge from the Western world, with a Germanic knowledge, Swiss knowledge, British knowledge, Australian knowledge, or American knowledge, and we begin to look upon the world of consumers in emerging markets with the same view as disadvantaged consumers in America, for example. And that bias comes in the way. So best consumer insights are actually counterintuitive. They challenge our prevailing wisdom, our belief systems, if you allow them to do that. Or create a great aha. Suddenly says, wow, I never thought about it. So in my latest research on genes, climate, and culture, I found fascinating that Northern European genes are all organized to take, take protein, calorie, and fat from the animal because they cannot grow vegetation. It's the evolutionary theory, just like um, Darwin's theory. So they take much more saturated fat from the animal source as opposed to plant-based, vegetation-based, protein, calorie, and fat. So I did research on cheese. Northern European cheese will have 40% fat content. Southern Europeans, Mediterranean countries, Italy, Greece, etc., would have 2 2.5% fat content. And as you go toward the equator, concept of cheese drops from all cultures. The role of saturated fat is taken over now by oils, olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, or avocado in Mexico. In India, this is obvious. Northern, Europe, Northern Indians have paneer as a concept. That's a daily intake almost, saturated fat. South India has no concept of paneer. Saturated fat now comes from oils. Fundamental difference. That's an aha. I found that's true for all foods, all clothing materials, all shelter. We have never studied north-south differences we have studied east-west differences because of the colonial expansion, especially the British Empire. So we study Rudyard Kipling and his famous saying, East is East, 
West is West and the twain shall never meet. He is dead wrong, by the way. He is not only dead but wrong. Have you seen the westernization of Asian children? They are just like their cousins in America. And now we see the Easternization of the world taking place in spirituality, for example, fusion in the foods, in the music, everything, which is fascinating. But we have not studied north-south differences between the Arctic climate, temperate climate, and tropical climate. Very interesting. All of a sudden it gives you an aha in a way you never thought about it, allows you to do your strategies accordingly, your distribution systems accordingly, and just goes on and on. So to me, counterintuitive or questioning prevailing wisdom and getting a great aha is very important. So let me conclude. Consumer insights research is very critical in emerging markets. This is because the unique context of all emerging markets, which is unbranded competition, socio-political governance, and lack of affordability. India is rapidly changing. The generation gap is getting shorter and shorter, and therefore consumer behavior is more dynamic than we ever thought by the demographic changes, and of course on the other side by technology and the cell phone revolution and the internet and the 4G and the 5G, whatever we talk about. Consumer insights is becoming more strategic as consumers change their consumption and shopping habits. Research on consumer insights is becoming more scientific at the same time as it transitions from observer research through opinion research to ultimately data research. And as I mentioned, the five biases, starting with the Western bias, or the perspective bias, or the technique bias, or the normative bias, are key issues that we need to struggle as scientists and observers and scholars. And we need to learn, therefore, to observe the consumers as they are without any prior judgments or belief systems. I wish a great success at the conference and the workshop, and I'm so sorry I cannot be there myself. Thank you.